If you're used to the Windows world or the Mac world, you think of a computer as potentially having multiple users, but the user is always the person who sits down at the computer. So you might have more, multiple user accounts, but only one person's logged in at a time, and that person who's logged in is the one who's sitting there in front of the computer. In the Linux world, that's not the case. You can have remote connections. You can log into machines from other places. And so we want to talk about how you can do that. I know that for my students, this is going to be something that they want to do. They will want to be able to connect to our lab machines. Uh, but there can be various reasons why you want to be able to log in to a remote sh machine and uh, do work on that machine. By the way, this is another reason for having command line experience because it's a lot easier to do a remote login through a command line than through a full GUI. And it can be done under over much slower connections as well. So there are a few commands that you can use to make remote connections. The first one is Telnet. Now, the thing to note about Telnet is that it, you probably can't use it. In fact, both of the first two commands that I'm going to show you probably will not work. Uh, for Telnet, you say Telnet and you give it the machine that you want to connect to. And then you would hit enter and it would attempt to connect to that machine. However, most machines have the Telnet connection blocked. And the reason for this is because Telnet is fundamentally not secure. Similarly, there is another command, RSH, which stands for Remote Shell, which allows you to do a similar type of thing. You remote connect and get, do a shell onto this other computer. Uh, once again, here though, this is not a safe way to do communication. And as security restrictions have grown over time, Basically, the use of Telnet and RSH are limited to very narrow uh, types of situations, either where you don't care about security or where you are only working inside of some internal setting, and so it, it doesn't matter. Instead, the command that you're probably going to use to connect to things is SSH, which is the secure shell. Uh, if you have installed SIGWIN under Windows, you actually have to add some additional packages so you can rerun the installer and find open SSH in there and that will uh, or that will give you the commands for SSH as well as another command SCP that we'll show in just a second. So SSH, I'm actually going to type in a valid machine here which happens to be one that I can log into remotely. And you'll note that when I do this, I am on a different machine now. And I have a different directory that I'm in. And I can use all the commands that I'm used to using. You know, to change directories, to look at files, whatever it is that I wanted to do, I can do that on that other machine. And so I'm actually, all of my commands here are running on that remote machine instead of doing it locally. What if you didn't want to run commands on the other machine, you wanted to copy files between the machines? Well, just like there is a CP command, the uh, OpenSSH package has an SCP, a secure copy, and SCP allows you to specify different machines that you can be doing the copying between. Turns out you can use SCP to do a simple thing like I can copy tiny file into tempdir. And if we look in tempdir, it's there. Okay. Uh, so you can use SCP to copy locally, but then it's pretty much just going through to, to CP. Where SCP is generally used is I want to copy a file either out to a remote destination or from a remote destination. And in order to do that, I have to prefix the file that I am copying or the destination with information about where it's going. So if I wanted to copy tiny file up to this machine, Bianca, 
I give it the file name and then a colon. And technically, if my username had changed, now I'm called M. Lewis on both of these machines, so I don't have to do this. But if my username were different on my local machine and the remote machine, I would have to put in my username at, much like an email address there. And then it's this colon that's very significant. If you don't have a colon here, it thinks you're copying to a local location. But that colon says this is going to something remotely. And then I need to give it the path for where it goes on that. So if I want it to be my home directory here, it would go there. If I wanted to make it that one directory that we just saw, something like that, then I could execute that command and SCP will go ahead and, uh, and do a copy. You'll note I'm getting some little error messages because we have module loading on that machine. Um, that's not really relevant. You will probably not see these things. SCP is kind of nice in that it has this, this indicator for how much is copied, how big, uh, how long you can expect to wait. If you're copying really big files across, it, it does estimating for you as opposed to CP, which is rather silent when it does its copy. Now, in this case, I took something and copied it, uh, a local file, to a remote destination. If I had put the machine specification on the first file, then I could copy to my local uh, and technically you can actually copy from a, remote des uh, from a remote file as a source to a remote location as the destination as well. So that gives you a brief overview of doing remote connections and moving files around remotely.